at Owatonic uh, in, in Nashua. Um, and, and it's the same concept uh, all over the north. If I don't have beaver pelts, which is the standard number one pelt, it's all based on a beaver pelt. But if I don't have a beaver, then I have, he says, two foxes equals one beaver. So he says, two woodchucks. There's, I know there's woodchucks here. <laughs> I know it. That's the national uh, critter of, of Massachusetts, isn't it? Certainly. It's on the, uh, the Chumpsford uh, coat of arms. Uh, eight minks in season, meaning the thicker fur of the winter, not, not the summer. Uh, thinner, because the animals shed, you know, obviously. Um, you were five pounds of feathers. You can, you can equate that to one beaver pelt. So five pounds of feathers for the feather beds. They would trade them in these big feather baskets and bring them in. Um, you can actually get feather baskets still in the uh, antique shops. Four seal skins is one beaver. One moose hide is two beavers. So there's this thing on the frontier. But what do they do with a beaver? Why is the beaver number one? So, what we're going to do is show, this is, when you, when you catch a beaver, you skin it, you dry it, uh, you wash it, and then as it's wet, you stretch it on this, on this hoop. So there might be 20 of them around your camp, just drying. It'll take a couple days, they're dry. This is just cardboard, it's a pizza box. That's all it is, because they don't want that. They just want the fur. So what they're going to do with the fur, so it's dried like that. Now, our people could, of course, the women, would certainly be able to soften the animal skin by, by as it's drying, if you soaked it in the animal brain, believe it or not, it has oils and um, uh, proteins. And as it's drying, it's doing this, and it's breaking it. So as, by the time it's dry, it's pure white and, and softened, because we need to stretch it. There's a, a, a dozen ways that you can do that. But you can, do it around a tree or around a rope that's stuck to the ground, any way you can do it. Have two people have tug of war, so you can break this fiber down and make it into a soft leather. Likewise, a deer skin, as you remove the hair, it's just the leather, and you can make it into what I'm wearing is, is just garment leather, just leather, no hair. But when the animals have a fur, you want to keep the fur. So like a bear skin or a, um, even a moose robe, I suppose, but that is treated like a deer usually. Um, but this, this, the softened leather is, is, is made into, it's smoked. So they would, they would uh, smoke it uh, golden color. So when we get that, that um, buckskin leather and it's kind of got that, that gold color, it's an imitation uh, attempt to harken back to smoked animal um, Indian brain tan leather. That's really what that is representing. Otherwise, leather is white. It's pure white but it can mildew, so you have to smoke it. Plus, when it gets wet and dries, it'll turn into a piece of cardboard, and you're not getting that, you're not getting that back. But if it's smoked, it adds more oils back into the leather, and the more smoked it is, almost to chocolate brown sometimes. I remember going to Alaska, and when I saw the Athabascan ladies dance by, they all had these dark chocolate brown uh, uh, dresses. Your eyes would almost water. It was so, that brain tan smell of that smoking up there was really more than any place I've ever, but you know, when we have these hides, you open the trunk and you're like, woo, because some people can't deal with it. Some people love it. So they got a, they got a brain tan hide to make a moccasin for uh, reenacting like, like we do. Um, if they have an apartment, their whole, their whole apartment smells like, um, like, a, like a smoke camp. But um, some people like it, some can't stand it. Maybe it depends on the type of smoke. So rotten birch bark or corn cobs or whatever you, you use or your family would, would know, you'd go, that looks like black feet or Athabascan leather. You can almost tell. I could tell if you held one up in the back. you go, where's this from? I go, Saskatchewan. He's like, yep. I might even know the family just by the color of it. I mean, some of these people today, there's not enough of it out there so that when it, you do see it, you can probably tell the source. It's pretty funny that way. In the old days, everybody did it. But the more you smoke it, the more, uh, and then you sew five or eight of these together, and you make a beautiful robe, okay? So he's going to, uh, and I only need so many for my family. Each one of us gets a new a beaver robe and um, so on. But really, what they're going to do with it in Europe is, make sure 
everybody can see. So there's two hairs. One is a long guard hair, and one is the, sh the soft wool. They call it in French the laine de castor, the wool of the beaver. So under a microscope, you can see my kid's microscope. Microscope. Science project. A. The thick one is the guard hair. The thick one. And they throw that away. They're going to they're gonna pluck... They're going to pluck that away to certain craftsmen. And the other ones, you can't really see it, but on this one, you can see barbs, like a rose thorn. And you can see that clearly under this one. This is the wool. It has uh, barbs and hooks on it. So when they uh, come, please come up. We have a whole hour after the talk. You can handle all this stuff. They're going to make something with that. They're going to make a certain product. What could that product possibly be? I can't, for the life of me, think what they're going to do with beaver fur. What could they possibly... Uh, gee, I wonder what that thing could be. How? What could it... It is a hat? Yes. It is a hat. It's a felt hat. Best cowboy hat. Today, Charlie One Horse, uh, Stetson, will say the number of uh, beaver that are used. Not a percentage so much, but the number of beaver, apparently, that's used, and it'll say right in the rim. So the beaver felt hat... The, the rims could be, the brims rather, could be this wide and they're very strong and they'll last 40 years because the, the hooks hold those hairs together when it's belted and, and pressed into this, into this form. Whereas other wolves, uh, like wool from a sheep or rabbit, uh, won't do that. They don't have the hooks. It's the only animal that has that. With rabbit, as a... <clears throat> This has nothing to do with pentacooks, but it, it kind of does. Um, it tells you why the drive for the fur trade is really why. So rabbit just doesn't work. It can a little bit because it has a slick coating that took mercury to take the slick coating off. Then it would static electricity. You could press it together. It'll hold. You can mix it with beaver. So a mix. But the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland is because he worked with rabbit fur and the mercury, and when he ate his lunch, guess what he had on his hand? Mercury. Beaver felt? No. Mercury. So the Mad Hatter caused insanity, nerve. Uh, anybody a doctor here? Can tell me what actually happens with mercury poisoning. It's not good. It's toxic to humans. So the kum kum is not, it's not uh, mercury anymore, is it? I mean, you, you can't. Well, maybe. In small amounts, in some traditional places, I could imagine. But boy, um, we get our we get our red paint from uh, from um, Indian uh, kumkum stores, and we mix it with uh, bear oil, or we, we use it. But it's not mercury anymore. This is the the, the um, it's um, mined in in uh, in uh, China and, and even Spain. I understand, and it has it, it was uh, cinnabar, and it, and it's. From cinnabar, we get the vermilion, bright vermilion red uh, powder today, is what, is what they call it in, in French. So the, the vermilion. Um, we had red ochre, which is the natural iron ore pigment, so a nice brick color. Uh, as my buddy Tony says, a beautiful huma color. Huma in that, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, the red people. That's what huma, huma means red. Okla is, is the people, red the red people. So Oklahoma means the red people, and uh, but that beautiful huma huma color is um, is a is a brick color, and that's the natural. But so there might be times when you have a ceremony that I have this vermilion, and it's very expensive. And I think there's vermilion. I can't remember if there's actually vermilion on this. Um, I believe there is. I'm not gonna go sit there and try to read. Um, what? But, but that, just that alone, red is a good luck color around the world. It, it's the color of fire, life, and blood especially. So when you animate ourselves uh, and our objects with red, that, that, that puts it in a different category. But they, the women now, the Ojibwe women said, well, we don't want, and I, and I assume when I say Ojibwe that the similar beliefs are, are right here too. Same Algonquin people, same uh, customs. Same. Um, uh, so when they said the women were doing a dye, a dye lot to, to dye some porcupine quills, um, they wouldn't allow.
allow the men to look into the red dye. Because if they're going to war, it, 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 um, it, it pre presages uh, um, them seeing blood and, and possibly uh, on injury or death. So they, won't, they, they wouldn't let the men look into that dye lot if it was red. Um, likewise, they say, well, you know, they're on the war trail. You don't scratch your own self. You know, I might, might actually draw my own blood. Now, if I'm going to draw my own blood, imagine what the enemy's going to do to me. So they give him a little stick. So I actually, technically, I'm not drawing my own blood. I'm, if I scratch myself from a mosquito bite, mosquitoes, right? So, but they give him a little stick, and they probably carry it right in there with their knife. So, like, you're talking about native, native thinking. This has got nothing to do with the Europeans. Zero. Zero. There is not one, even during the wars. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this, just, uh, it puts the whole thing in perspective. These guys are not fighting the same war. There is not one um, example of a rape on the, on the warfare here on, on, on the uh, eastern frontier. Of all the Indian wars, not one. Not one legitimate one. We know of one fake one, and it was, it was in some Pennsylvania newspaper. But it was so totally bogus, everybody knew, no Indian would do that. What are you talking about? Everybody, they couldn't even lie about it. It was so unknown to the Indian people. I'm telling, I'm saying that they are not, they're fighting a parallel universe here. Their whole lifestyle is not with these people. They might be friendly with these guys. Uh, what family was this originally? Here. Yep. Adams. This was Adams? I knew some Adams. Nice people. A couple actually crazy. Uh, actually, actually, I knew a couple of them were crazy. Remember Richie Adams, the police officer? <laughs> Boy, he used to chase us around the center of town. I never was in trouble with him, but it, I, you know, I respect, I respect the police officer. Um, but what I'm saying is that the Indian people are not, they're just, they're, they have a whole different set of priorities, and, and rightfully so. And, but their techniques, are ancient techniques of fishing, survival, um, craft work. Imagine having to weave one of these. I've seen farmer, um, colonial era, farmer made snowshoes. And they look like a seventh grader did it. Looks like a seventh grader history report. Perfectly good for walking over to the barn to milk old Betsy the cow, but not for going 300 miles north through the, through the wilderness to Quebec City, or come down from Three Rivers or Quebec City, raid here, and then return with prisoners on snowshoes. No English, uh, no Englishman ever did that. They, that's not what they did. They might have, they might have chased these guys, you know, 20 miles, and then like, all right, I'm done. Or they might have gone up the Saco River to uh, to Freiburg. There was a couple of. Uh, uh, by the time the snowshoe uh, patrols, the snowshoe rangers got um, up and going. The, the Indian Wars were pretty much over here. But it, it, it took the guys that lived here on the, on, in Chelmsford, Dunstable, where Kingsborough is, and Exeter and York, Maine. These are the frontier guys. And they were, they were the only guys that could go chase these war parties down. They were the only ones. <coughs> Excuse me. But what, what delicate art that is. This is beautiful art. And so much so that everything from the pouches to the, the, the weavings to uh, basketry, uh, not so much the pottery, that it was, it was disappearing very quickly, the, the technology. Um, but all kinds of these objects are found in, um, in Europe, in the European. The officers would return back to Europe and bring these collections of these objects back and give them either to their kings or as gentlemen, I'm not saying as the ladies couldn't have done it, but generally it was a gentleman's curiosity cabinet. So when he's having a party on Saturday night, all his other buddies go, and what is this? Well, this is the rare shell from the new islands that we have just discovered. And this is a war club from the savages of North America. I believe it was Huron. Ooh, Huron, I have heard of this word. So everything in the Paris collection is Huron. It's not, but that's what they say, because all the records were lost in the French Revolution when they ransacked the king's palace and took his collection of cool Indian stuff 
from here, uh, well, actually, probably more around the St. Lawrence, but who knows? Uh, the records were gone. So we can just look at them and, and see war clubs and arrows and snowshoes from this time period. This is gold to us because we're trying to an animate it for museum work uh, and, um, and documentary work and, um, and, and research books and just reenacting living history as we, we all like it as a hobby. But um, what we could call this experimental archaeology. We have learned to make and use all of these items within the, the, the law. So some things are illegal to use the way they used it back then, but um, I, I could still make one. And yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask, what is that made of? And do they use skin or gut to make the snowshoes? Right. Uh, this, this, what this is made out of? Yeah. This is a ball root, and they, and they, they cut uh, or, or, or the uh, a burl on a branch. But usually, it's the, the ball root coming out of an embankment of a, of a river. And it has a, a, you know, they'll they'll just sit there and whittle this thing down. But it's the man's life story is on there. Yeah, so, cool. and it may not be him that actually carved it either. So we have an example where one Ojibwe boy, he's like the the, the, the author of this uh, study. He goes, Hey kid, where'd you get that? And he goes, Well, this is my story. This is how many. This is my clan. This is my clan symbol here, and I carve it on a tree at the battle site. We stripped the bark and I actually put the same hieroglyphics. And this is how many warriors were in my war party and, and so, much, so on. This arrow is uh, for war. If it was broken, it means I was wounded. There's a whole hieroglyphics. This says, um, this says the many times that he's gone to war and then the Z connects it to either wampum belts or a mat. So the mat means I go home to my mat. This is where I live. This is where I eat. I'm born on the mat. I'm buried in my mat. I live and, 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 and eat on my mat. Our lives are on our mat. So they say, go home, the Mohawk said to the Mohicans when they wanted to join the revolution. Just go home to your mats and be quiet. Don't worry about these colonials versus the, the redcoats. We'll take care of that. And the Mohicans are like, now nah, we're going to Lexington. We're on our way. We're already on our way. They didn't listen to the Mohawks. But it, that kind of um, that kind of verbiage, using the symbolism of your everyday life. So the mat is, is everything. So how many mats? It means how many warriors or how many occasions? Because one of the words for a, a, a warrior in Mohawk actually refers to them carrying their mats on their back. How many mats are in your party? Oh, it means how many how many uh, head counts? But this says I went to war from war. I didn't even go home. So like Madaka Wando, when he came and they burned Dover, uh, Durham, uh, Oyster River, they all went back to Penacook and hung out there. And everybody, all the Kennebecs went back to Maine by canoe. And uh, yeah, they came east. No, they came west through, the, through uh, like uh, Sebago Lake and Ossipee and then came down to Merrimack, came to Concord and then went back the same way. They didn't, they, wouldn't go, they couldn't go through the ocean anymore because all the English settlements. But Madaka Wando, uh, Nathan's great-great-grandfather and the Penobscots <coughs> said, we're going to go on to Groton. So they went to war from war. So he, they went and burned Groton to the ground. And every time we go through Groton or these places, I go, your, your great-grandfather burned that place to the ground. He's like, oh, whatever. <laughs> y yes, ma'am. So when, when the, Mo no, the Mohicans went to Lexington. Yes, Stockbridge Mohicans. Who were they fighting for? Why would they want to? So you don't throw rocks when you live in a glass house. You're completely surrounded by the English settlements in Albany and Massachusetts. Everything you depends is on them. You have no zero connection with the French whatsoever, other than occasional. You might hunt up near Otter River in Vermont. That was the limit of the Mohican hunting territory. But really, um, as they said in the records, I'm not, I wouldn't make that up. So I'm not. You can ask me how I know anything, and I'll tell you how I know it or why I believe such. So that's important. I'm not just, it's not just my opinion. I actually have a reason for when I say that. And by the way, this is just the leather. So if, I, if, I, if we took all the hair off of a deer skin and made it into parchment, just, just cardboard, no hair. You can, what was that a biblical story where it, he says, if you, if you, you can be, um, how did that go? If you, can, if you can cover, ha, 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 this city with this uh, ram skin, then um, you can marry the, the king's daughter, or you can be the king, or whatever, you can claim victory. So 
what they did is they just cut a cord around and around and around and around, and you just make an endless cord. And, around, and now if you've got a, um, an animal pelt, especially a deer, um, sometimes you could see uh, barbed wire scars and ticks. And, and if, you, if you cut a cord and it hit that, it's going to break right on that, on that imperfection. So I always cut around it. But you can just cut. You've got good scissors. But in those days, you, know, might, you might have to uh, stick a knife in a board and just very carefully uh, pull it and split it. And they were good at it. And those women would, would, would uh, that's all this is, only wet it. And there's different scales of it. So very thin. So it's not gut. Uh, they have that also. This is just uh, the animal skin. And this is just happens to probably be, well, up north they, they figured uh, caribou stretches less than deer skin when wet. So that's important. When these things get sock and wet, soft and wet, they, they tend to stretch. But, um, um, this, I mean, this is certainly just deer. Um, uh, it could be moose, I guess, but, you know, they did notice the difference between different animal, the, the qualities of different animals had, you know, in different conditions, like the caribou retains its uh, strength when wet. That's just the thing that you would need to know if you were living out in, you know, in that area. Um, so uh, the, the Penacooks were, during the colonial wars, were in this no man's land. They've been cut off by the ocean by settlement, so they couldn't go down to the ocean anymore. So they're really, for, they're living at Wamaset on that 100-acre island, just like, you know, just, they're disarmed. They, they got some corn growing. They're, they're in starving condition. The colony uh, uh, promised them to, to support them. If you guys will do some occasional scouting for our militia groups or warn us of an attack, which they did, which they did. And they were going to go to Waldron. They were on their way to Waldron because they got uh, two Pentecooks came in and warned henchmen and, and the commander here in Chelmsford. He sent a dispatch all the way to Amesbury, and he was going to warn Waldron, you're going to get attacked in the morning. Meanwhile, Waldron's entertaining everybody in his house. Oh, let the poor, ch the poor creatures sleep by the women. It's like, he's like, Major, there's an awful lot of Indians in the neighborhood. They're here to trade, they say, to trade. But um, the women want to come in and sleep by your fire in your, in your, uh, in your great room. You can go over here to the, to the, to the house. And you can see by the great uh, fireplace, that was the great room. And everybody, you know, that's where travelers would sleep, you know. And um, he's like, yeah, let the poor creatures sleep, he says. Um, and, um, and then she's, one of the women said, and this is the, it's written. She said, so i got to go out and use the facilities. How do I open this gate? Because they were all palisaded. It was a garrison. And, uh, well, you just unlock it here and open it. She's like, oh, okay. Like in the Trojan horse story. Like, okay. So she just let all the warriors in and they killed Waldron. They did some very nasty things to him. Because he was a rat fink jerk, murderous jerk. And they never forgot. And that was Waldron. But not so with Chelmsford. Chelmsford had a love-hate relationship. But yet, just never really. It was probably good enough that they, they just weren't. I don't know. It's worth looking into. Why? Why not kill? There's a couple of real good characters here that probably, I'm surprised, weren't killed. Um, but uh, the, the Pentecook were a dwindling tribe. And maybe that might be the bottom line, is that if they were just uh, dwindling in numbers. The old Juan Lancet and just a handful of people living at Wamaset. And uh, the rest of them were like, uh, have none of this. They, they had, and even Juan Lancet himself had gone up to Chambly, Quebec to, to stay. So when he, he, uh, he came back to Tang uh, to live out his days and, and beg that, um, begged that he uh, um, could stay in his homeland, he's buried right, right there where the Tang mansion was. He's buried somewhere right there. Probably below that rock is a ledge right there. Dr. Wang bought the, the property, and they ripped the Tang mansion down where it mysteriously burned. And, and well, what a historic site. The, the steps of the house is still there. The steps. It's, it's a landscaper guy. And if you move that step, you probably find a king's pine tree shilling underneath that. Because that's what you do. You put a, you put a coin under the front step of a, of, a, of, a, of a house for good luck. All these colonial houses. Oh, yeah. Um, this is a capote, a French capote. So 
So it's, it's a nice garment weight. It doesn't have to be this big, heavy duffel blanket, but it's good for mosquitoes. It's good for, uh, you know, a sash, put a sash around that. But this one lancet had been so used to seeing and having one in Quebec that he had to get permission from Ting. And it, Ting wrote it to Boston. He's like, uh, I don't know if he didn't know what it was, which I can't hardly believe, or he was getting permission to get funding to buy one, have one made for, because he, he wasn't going to give one lance at anything. He was going to sell it to him or get paid by the government for, for having this old guy living there. So I think he lived there three years with him. But this is, this is one of those very French objects. This is a very French um, thing. The English don't, don't use these things. They don't know what they are. It's a sailor's garment, really. But the galley slaves on the Mediterranean wore them, but they were brown because in case they escaped, it's like wearing a striped uh, prison outfit. So the brown capote, oh yeah, he's, a, he's an escaped galley slave. But here, this is perfect for, for the wilderness for us. Perfect. This is one of those things that just kind of entered into the, into, the, um, into, the, um, uh, into the culture. Now, this, I wanted to show this because it's kind of cool. <coughs> Believe it or not, I, I, I do have 40 of these. This is hardtack, ship's biscuit. Has the king's broad arrow. It's it's the Royal Navy. So the French have and they capture it at sea, but they have barrels of these things, and they would give them out to people, to war parties, to uh, militia companies, to uh, ships uh, crews, and it's just like you only had one tooth. This would, this would just this would break that tooth. You know those guys had great dental uh, yeah. hygiene. Um, but what you do is you, you smash this with your belaying pin or your fid, and, and you put it in your soup. That's what you did with it. And all it is is bread, uh, uh, flour, and water, triple baked, zero uh, moisture. But it was marked with King's Broad Arrow. Mm. Forty of these, he says, on this. This is, this is perspective. Equals one beaver pelt for the hat making in season. Six knives, six common table, English table knives from the 17th century with these cannon barrel shaped play, uh, handles and all. This is six common table knives, nothing special. Six of these equals one beaver pelt. So what he's telling you is six of these equals 40 biscuits. Today, if I make a, a, a sheath knife, they generally go for about $100. I make reproduction uh, Dutch, English, and French. I, that's what I make. So it's 100, about 100 bucks with a sheath, right? 40 biscuits for six of them? I'm at $600? Are you kidding me? For, for 40 biscuits? So I'm telling you that it says to me, food is number one on the frontier. So. If you broke this, this trade list down, which is very fascinating, and you guys, I'll leave you guys, Deb, I'll leave this here because you talk about, uh, I have other copies. We just printed it uh, on parchment paper you can get from, from, you know, Staples or one of those places on the old parchment looking. But as a truck house list, this is um, telling us that over one-third of the objects right on here are cloth. Another... Another fifth, uh, third, is food. Corn, Indian corn meal, flour, uh, barrels of pork. Um, yeah, that's what they were eating. Um, not very good. It made everybody sick, but hey. Um, you also had um, um, alcohol is not on here. Tobacco, four pecks of peas, one beaver skin. Five pecks of Indian meal, one beaver skin. Five pecks of Indian corn. Now, a peck is what? How many pecks in a bushel? Two. Two? That's quite a lot, actually. Wow. But then two yards of cotton. Cotton is a new thing. Cotton is not normal. It's, it's, a, new, it's a new product. It comes from India. Um, in the Calico, Calicut, India, Calicut, India. So these are printed or striped, um, or just plain cotton at that time. But it was experimental here and a new, a brand new thing. So some places want they want the linen trade. 
So the importers always want, there was always a war between innovation, innovation and importing. So it depends on what law you're trying to get around, it depends on who's in power, whether you can uh, create your own uh, industries here in North America or not much more than a trickle. If you wanted to go full blown into a, an in industry, the mother country, some, some sheriff would show up and fine you and, and have your place shut down or locked down. That's just how it was. But they were, were New Englanders. We don't care about that. But, you know, John Hancock was a smuggler. That's why he didn't want search and seizure of his warehouse. That's why they put that, I believe, in the Constitution or in the Bill of Rights. No search and seizure without good, just cause. But he was a smuggler. It just tells you what's really going on. But these guys were always in, innovating and, and just surviving. Just surviving. It's not going to hurt anybody. You know, um, if we all decided to start a nuclear plant in Westford, that eh, might hurt somebody. So we should be regulated. They shouldn't allow that. But weaving uh, your, your sheep wool into a, into a scarf, we, no, no one should get in trouble for that. It, it is ridiculous. But, if so, but they, they, they looked the other, everybody who I think was doing it out, outside of the city, I think, you know. Um, but this, this is a very, one hat band, a hat with a hat band is one, uh, two beaver skins, if it had the hat band. This doesn't really count as the hat band, but just the hat itself. Now, why, how ironic is, is one beaver skin? Uh, but how ironic is selling hats, beaver pelt, beaver fur hats back to the Indian people. How ironic is that? And why would an Indian want it? Well, it's fashionable. It's, it's truly fashionable. So these were just becoming, at this time, flat brim. They were just becoming not quite a three-corner, but the, the custom was to take it off and pinch it. And you probably spent half your time holding it. So it, it gets pinched. Anyway, you know, at some point, they just make it into a three-cornered hat, as we call it a tricorn today. But this is what drove these people all the way to the Great Lakes and beyond was beaver felt. Other animals, sure, obviously, and they have use for leather, you know, workmen's aprons, you know, deer skins, or even moose. I don't know what they were. They were making gloves with some of the uh, with some of the um, the animal skins. In fact, I believe they were making some. Uh, ladies' gloves out of the beaver skins when they went to Europe. They would soften them after they took the, the hair off. In fact, it, they would send these beaver pelts, well, the, the, the um, castor sec, the dry beavers, they would sell, send these to the Moscow people, to Russia. And they had a way of plucking the guard hair and leaving the wool. They had a way of doing it industrially. And then, uh, no, how, no, how did that go? But they had these secrets, and the French didn't know it, and the English didn't know it, but the Russians had a secret. And there was, there was all these um, state secrets that, that were, you just went to certain countries, and they just knew what to do with it, and, 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 and it's, uh, it's a, you know, like, why do they have to send it all the way over there? Because it saved them a bunch of time and money. So the beaver, the beaver is king, and that's one of the reasons why we were all sitting here. But now settlement for the English starts creeping. So the, the Merrimack Valley becomes a settlement pattern. But the north side gets a little wanky. It's, it's a wilderness still. There's got a few activities up and down the Merrimack, maybe as far as uh, uh, Contoucook, you know, outside of um, uh, south of Manchester. There's a couple of uh, uh, sawmill guys. Well, they're not sawmills, they're just working trees. They're just tree cutters. So, he, But nobody's living up there. It's still Indian land. Um, there's no patents, royal patents, or settlement yet. Um, I mean, I just, I just find all this stuff fascinating, and having lived here, I, you know, I knew enough about, I mean, there was uh, somewhere up on Stedman Street, I always knew that um, there was an Indian, there was some Indian um, Beautiful. I've seen uh, Indian spear points come out of it, and I don't—I never knew where that was. It's got to be near drinking water, because people, humans, don't live. If you can't, you know, they're not drinking out of a swamp out behind the Ford dealership, in, in uh, you know, up, up by, um, you know, Drum Hill. That's not. 
you need fresh drinking water. So it's always important. So there, there's a spring nearby. I mean, the Europeans would dig a well, but the Indian people, don't, they, don't, they don't dig a well. So they're, they're restricted to, and you can't drink out of a beaver pond either, because beaver pond, the beaver um, uh, feces will, will cause giardia, and that, that will kill um, all the, uh, all the um, absorb, absorption in your, in your stomach, uh, intestine, and, and then you can't absorb food, and you slowly would starve until it, unless a doctor can find that and, and, uh, and stop that deterioration of that, it's not cilia, it's um, something like that. And, and um, so Giardia is not good, so you can't drink uh, beaver pond water. Um, can't drink ocean water, so the settlements, you can stay at the beach for a little while, but we all got to bring a cooler full of uh, soft drinks and, you know, and whatever. But if there's a spring nearby, fresh water, okay, so that's okay. But if you're out on the lakes, you know, you're paddling, you know, this is, this is a, this canoe paddle is pretty long. Look how tall this is. This is so that you can stand up in the, in the stern of the canoe and steer by standing and, and see the rocks. Because this is New England, right? It's rocky. So you can also push off with it, but it, it gives you the control with these long blades. Now, the, the Avant, or the, in, the, in the Voyager tradition of the Great Lakes, this is the gouverneur in the, in the stern, the captain, right? But the Avant, he's, he's, a, he's also got a long one, but his, his position in the boat is also very high up. But the, the guys, the crew, they're using short dagger paddles. This big wide one, in fact, would, would, would um, if you were doing this as a crew member, you'd be fatigued in no time. So their, their, their paddling is a different, completely different paddle. It's short and narrow. It's just like fast, 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 all day long. Then you take a pipe break. It's like a coffee break, but it's tobacco. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Kids, don't smoke. And that's in their contract, as a matter of fact. And they, they would always gauge how, how long a trip was by canoe, how many pipes. So uh, Crown Point up on uh, Lake Champlain is uh, in Bulwaga Bay. So it sounds to me, in that my ear, it sounds like the uh, Algonquin word, powagan, pipe. Like, in other words, the final pipe, that's our destination, which was, in fact, at, for the most of the time, that was the final southern French uh, advance post. The next one they built was Ticonderoga, 15 miles to the south, but that was still um, 30 years away. So Bulwaga, <coughs> Bulwaga Bay, <coughs> it always sounded to me like that was... Um, like Sheboygan, Chi Apuagan, big pipe, the big pipe, the final pipe, the end of the, tr the trip. But Sheboygan, Michigan, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Hmm. That's what it sounds like to my, to my ear. But Bulwaga Bay, I have no doubt in my mind that that was relating to the, the pipe smoking culture, which these guys did. I mean, they, they, grew, they grew squash, they grew to, uh, tobacco, they grew um, uh, corn, they grew... Um, and beans, you know, the usual, the three sisters, obviously, but seasonal food. You gotta go where the fish are, you gotta go uh, fall uh, winter hunting. Um, you can't wait for the winter hunting because um, you can see the tracks easier. You could, you know, you get a, you shoot a moose now, that, that meat's gonna turn rancid really fast. It really, it really does turn uh, yellow in a day. Same with bear meat, you know. I mean, if you can, get, if you can skin it. And, and smoke, get it smoking fast. Yeah, but um, um, so you got to know your, you got to know your uh, your uh, animals, and you got to know what what those things do. And uh, um, so if, if you're eating, uh, if you got bear grease, and you mix it with your paint, and you put it on on your our bodies, face, mix it with paint or not, it it, it, it prevents the cold. It's like a those, uh, you know, they swim the English Channel and they grease themselves up with Vaseline so they don't get uh, th hypothermia. Well, bear grease works like that. Um, and uh, just oil, the bear oil, which separates from the grease, is two, basically two different products. It's clear. It's odorless. It's, it's excellent to cook with and, and, and all that kind of thing. But you can use it for a little bit of waterproofing uh, and that kind of thing. But the, um, the, um, the oil... That mosquitoes just don't like to land on it. Doesn't have to be. You can mix it with some other root or something, but it is not necessary. 
They just don't like the oil. They don't, just don't like landing on oil surf surfaces. Um, but I always wonder in the back of your mind if an Indian would say, it has bare energy as well. Because I know I would. I'd be thinking as I'm eating it, like, you know, if I really want a shot of something, I'm like, I'm going to have some venison tonight. I really need some venison. I really, you know, you know, I've had how many, how many hamburgers, how many pork roasts, Nathan, what, he hates curry, I love curry, but, um, you know, but when I get out the, 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 the venison, I'm like, you know what, I really, I really need this right now. I know that deer, you know, I got the, I had this thing, and uh, so, to me, there's an intimate world, and I'm just, I just, I just touch it once in a while, you know, but if, if we live that way, all the time, for 24-7, for thousands of years, we, we, we couldn't, uh, we wouldn't know any different. We would just, that's like that's the way it is. Those people are crazy living in that big house. You know how much firewood they use? They said, a uh, smart Indian make small fire and get close. Uh, European make big fire and stay away from it. That's, a, that's a, a, a joke, but you know what? There's some truth to it. I mean, I understand the cooking techniques and the, the, uh, the way of life is, is a whole different ballgame. It's, it's a completely different um, set of technology and knowledge and, and, um, and techniques. But it's also based on the, the, the domesticated world that the Europeans are coming from. Uh, but here, these guys, I bet if you dug around here, they would find augmented... Uh, wild game uh, bones. If you found their, their midden site where they their trash heap, find deer bones, I bet. Snapping turtle parts. I don't know what, uh, woodchuck, certainly woodchuck parts. Because um, they do in other places and they note uh, codfish bones or they note, um, as they do with the native uh, village sites. And that's a lot like we, we do know. I mean, to the smallest animal. Because any food is, is, is good food when you starve it. And these guys are starving. This is, you know, imagine this place under six feet of snow, and, and uh, where do you eat if there's no food? So if you see a mouse, okay, it's something. We'll make a whole soup out of it. We'll add some stones, and we'll have stone mouse soup. And, and at least we'll have some broth. <coughs> and if we had some, uh, some uh, ship's biscuits, or if we had some uh, parched corn, anything, anything, they were, uh, was it Radisson, when they were in Wisconsin, he, even with the native people he was with and up on the Lake Superior uh, camp they were at, they went out and dug up the bones of some deer and then pounded the bone into a, into a meal and then boiled that just to survive. It's just to live another day. Is the whole, that is the whole philosophy of the whole thing. Live another day. If, if we're all here, we got one deer, that deer is going to be gone tomorrow. So eat up, everybody, all our relatives will eat now. We might, if there's some left, I doubt it, but we'll eat it all now. We'll share, none will go hungry. In fact, I, we will go hungry before you guys go hungry. We'll make sure you eat. We will absolutely, because we're going to go hunting. We're going to go hunting, we'll go get a deer. He's going to sing his magic song, he's going to play his magic drum, and I'm going to dance, and, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever i got to do. I'm going to burn something or sacrifice something. We will, we, will make, we will say those holy words, and we will go and do this thing. You guys will eat. But some of the stories said the women. And this is general around the world. I'm, I'm saying, is this Pentecook? Oh, maybe not. But it's, it's typical all over the northern Indian world where the woman might say, no, I want you guys. We have one steak left. Each one of you get a, a morsel, or maybe take it all. We'll be fine. We're, we're just going to feed the fire. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll boil off a couple of uh, moccasins. How's that? But you need the energy to go get that moose. So maybe it's like that, too. So it's whatever. Uh, but, but both sides, I've heard both of those sides. And one of the cool stories I always liked was, um, is, um, uh, so... The women, three Indian women, are coming down a trail, and they got a kettle. This is a brass kettle, great trade item. Beats one of these, right? A 
beautiful and as traditional as a clay pot is, how fragile is that in a canoe culture, right? But this brass kettle from the French and from the English, great. Indestructible. And I would cut it up, make armbands and arrow points and all kinds of things out of it. That brass would never go to waste if it did get dented and, and broken and cracked and so on. Anyway, so they're coming down a trail, a portage trail. So when you come up and you're in your canoe, as a canoe culture, you come up to a waterfall on the river, what do you do? You're in a boat. Do -do 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 -do. Oh, waterfall, rapids. What do you do? You walk around it. You take the boat and you portage. Owenagin is the Indian word. Owenagin. Say that. Owenagin. But the um, Owenagin is a little portage. But in French, porte means to carry. So you carry the canoe. So these portage areas can be 50 feet or they can be five miles. Or you can go between watersheds from a lake to another river over a mountain or a hill. And then it could be five miles. And in, in uh, Grand Portage, Grand Portage, the big portage, I think it was nine miles between Lake Superior and I think it's the Mouse River. Up in, it goes into Manitoba. So it's the far end of Lake Superior. Anyway, these women are coming down the Portage Trail, these three Indian gals. They got some fish. And they see some Frenchmen. They're, uh, they're at a, um, what they call a, um, a, um, a repo, a, a rest, a rest area halfway. So they're at a repo. And, and so they're sitting there. They got their kettle. No, the women have the fish. That's okay. So the, the French guys are sitting there. They're making their, they had their, um, their soup. And um, so they, they've just had their lunch. And they're about ready to, to keep, you know, they got their, their trade good bales. This bale on the end here represents any of these trade goods um, packed very well in, in, in like rolls of cloth or uh, a box of knives. and However, they carefully pack this stuff in 90-pound weights to carry around the portages. Um, more Great Lakes than here, but you get the idea. So these guys are just at their, at their lunch break halfway. The Indian women come and they go, oh, Frenchmen, Nittagush, the stick waver, we Mittagush, the stick wavers, meaning the cross that came, they just saw the, the Jesuits waving. <coughs> so the story goes. So they go, Nittagush, hey, can we borrow your kettle? A chaudière, as the French call it. A, a, a kick is an Indian, a kick. So they go, sure. And, and they get, the French guys are like, look, Indian girls, check it out. Like, sure, sure, sure. Ha, hey, have at it, sisters. So they're sitting there, they're boiling their, their fish, and, and the, the French guys are doing their just smoke, you know, smoking their pipes, whatever. And uh, who knows what they were thinking. But anyway, the Indian girls noticed some other Indians coming down the portage trail. They're like, Off they go, into the bush. Indians come by, busy place. It's the rest area, you know. Everybody's coming through there. Hey, how's it going? How's the chief? You know, what's, what's new on the frontier? Anything back in Quebec? Oh, no, no news. So-and-so drowned. Oh, gee, that's not good. Okay, I'll hear about that. Big ceremony. Okay, uh, i got to get some gifts. Okay, so you know. Okay, see you. You know, so Guadman. Uh, okay, so off they go. The women come back out of the woods. Give the kettle back as they're licking your fingers, finishing up the fish. What's the moral of the story? They would have had to share with the other Indians. They didn't have to share with the Frenchmen. It's not part of the culture, but they're obligated to share with these total strangers. But they're other native people. You're obligated, because sure enough, they're going to be hungry. Guaranteed. But you're obligated to offer it to them, as we would in any of our homes who would let somebody, a visitor to your home, go hungry? We wouldn't do it. You know, and I think uh, it's, it's um, when we remember, would you like something to drink? Would you like some coffee? If nothing else, you know, if nothing else. And uh, I, I had a man, when I was living at Bartlett Street, I, had, I knew a, a Sioux guy, a Lakota. He had come to, to my driveway with a couple of his buddies. And um, he had just, he had just, um, in my opinion, hurt a nice, beautiful um, Indian girl that I knew, you know, broke up with her kind of thing. And, and I just didn't like this guy. And, um, yeah, Manny Hatchet. I, <laughs> anyway, he's back. I, I, anyway, I, I was just mad at him, and it was a lesson. My, uh, and I didn't offer him nothing, those guys. And they, they went on their way. And my aunt, I, she later said, she goes, you didn't even offer him any water? I go, no. 
She goes, even prisoners get water. I'm like, she's right. You know, she's right. So now I try to, this is Charlie Manson. He's not, I'm not going to give him anything. But you know what I'm saying is that um, we're decent people, and we should learn these lessons. And, 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 it's, and it's basic life um, sustaining uh, practices of sharing and, and love, even and respect, if nothing else, for even for our enemies. Uh, um, so the, the, the kids we hate in, in, in seventh grade, I wish I, I, there's so many things I would, I would, I would uh, go back in time and fix uh, like about 20 things I, could, I, I keep naming in my mind. Like, I would never do that again. I would, I would, I am so ashamed of that stupid teenage behavior because I would not do that now. And, and I would be ashamed if he did it or, or one of you guys. I know you wouldn't do that. But to be aware of when you're doing, when it's right, happening right in front of you, you do the right thing. And you, then you have learned that lesson, you know. And I see these guys living that life and death in the simplest thing, the simplest uh, uh, sharing on the frontier is so important, and uh, as it is here. So if an Indian came.